Good evening and welcome into the Alana Inquirer podcast. It's Jeremy Warner and Derek Piper live at TD Garden where a phenomenal Illinois basketball season ended with a huge thud as the Illini fall to number one overall seed defending national champion UConn 77-52. Why I picked a bad night to have a bad night? You had to have an A-plus game, A game at least against UConn to win. I actually thought their defense was locked in in the first half. You're only down 28-23 despite terrible offense, and we'll talk about the strategy of that offense uh, in this podcast. We'll talk about this season as well uh, and what is ahead with the transfer portal already buzzing. But a 77-52 loss all because of a 30 to nothing run for UConn in the final minute and a half through the first, what, eight minutes of the second half. It was just as big of a knockout blow as you'll see from a dominant team. UConn has won 10 straight games in the NCAA tournament by 23 point average. It's insane. Derek Piper, just first thoughts on what was just an ugly night for the Illini. Boy, it really was. Yeah. A number of different things come to mind. Uh, I think big picture, obviously, like you said, really, really good season. Uh, Incredible to be back on this second weekend stage, the doorstep of a Final Four. I know it doesn't feel – the Final Four doesn't feel all that close when you lose in that capacity, although the thing is, I think what makes this really painful is that Illinois was only down five at the half and had a lot of fans believing that they they withstood that first haymaker from UConn. They had the crowd going there, down 9 nothing. Damascus gets going, and they they withstand. And uh, the way the defense competed to to hold that UConn team down, and I don't think they made a three in the first half, or maybe only had one. One. A one so, of 11. One of 11. So uh, it was just, could Illinois' offense wake up? Um, unfortunately, UConn just went absolutely buck wild. They're a machine. I mean, and they're absolutely incredible. Uh, the other side of it, obviously, is Illinois – schematically didn't I, I wish they would have pivoted quicker i wish that uh, i thought that a big way for everyone to have success is using coleman hawkins to stretch five against Klingon. you got to limit the opportunities of ty rogers out there because Klingon's just going to plant the lane we saw his impact as a rim protector the single coverage on him at the other end with coleman was tough it's tough to deal with it's tough to double because you can't choose the three so well so they they present those problems to you for a reason they're probably you know, they're widely thought of as the shoe in uh, favorite for the national title. Now, maybe, you know, Purdue can give them a hell of a game. You got two great big guys. You got shooters and all that. But um, there's one thing I'm, I'm going to write about. Um, different levels of elite. You know, get to the Elite Eight. Not everybody's created equal. Um, but, yeah, Illinois just should feel really, really good about what this season is going to be remembered as. They're probably going to have an Elite Eight banner, I imagine. Going to have a, a Big Ten title uh, trophy and banner and just a, even though I thought that Illinois didn't perform well, I thought Brad could have done some different things coaching wise. Still, his best coaching job at Illinois. Still, a yeah. heck of a season, and um, yeah, hard, just hard to to watch what was maybe the most fun team or one of the most fun teams that we've seen go out like that. Yeah, I I think UConn is rolling to a national title. Like I, I think it'll be UConn and Purdue, uh, and, and I think Purdue's an interesting matchup, but Klingon. Against Edie, like if there's anybody that can go one on one with Edie, it could be Klingon. And I just give me all the rest of the pieces of of uh, UConn over Purdue, even though I love Braden Smith and they got some shooters around him. This team's a juggernaut. Like this, this is a college basketball dynasty, most likely. I think they're going to go to Phoenix and win the whole thing again. Uh, they are one of the best college basketball teams I have ever seen. That said, Illinois played poorly, and I think part of that is the idea was to get Donovan Klingon in foul trouble. Right was attack him, get him in foul trouble. The refs swallowed the whistle tonight, and Illinois never adjusted to that, Derek. It felt like, let's just keep doing this. Whether it was Brad, I know during the TV interview, he said, we'll keep going at him, keep going at him. I don't like that. Um, And you asked him about it afterwards. He just said, we tried to spread him out. We talked about spreading him out. Really didn't answer uh, the question all that much. But I just thought there were times where Terrence Shannon had to be smarter. And you break down a defense, you get clinging, kick it out, get, get somebody to shoot the three. They, they barely shot any threes in that first 15 minutes, it felt like. Uh, and then Quincy Garrier had some really questionable decisions going at him, tried to dunk on Klingon. It's like, dude, that guy's great. Like This is what he's good at. You have to work around it. Uh, and you just didn't get those open shots, and they just didn't make them at the beginning of the second half. And you missed them. You didn't get any offensive rebounds. And they just got out, and it was layup and dunk line. And it was just – Illinois had no answer for it. They scrambled. You could tell they were forcing things, and can't do that against this UConn team because they're just going downhill, man. This this team's just a rolling juggernaut. 
Oh, UConn was playing rec league uh, in the in the middle of the second half. What they were doing in transition, Illinois wasn't getting back. I think they just kind of had, had gotten knocked out and uh, lost their juice at that point. Lost their confidence. They were they were rattled for sure. Uh, but yeah, I think that in talking to, to Coleman and Quincy, Quincy admitted that you know he made some poor decisions that he challenged Klingon when he shouldn't have. That he was hesitant from three. Coleman mentioned that he felt like. He needed to get involved more in the offense. Now, it was kind of interesting that UConn made the decision when Quincy and Coleman were both on the court that Klingon was shadowing, for the most part, it seemed like Gary A uh, rather than Coleman. There were times when Coleman had that matchup, but um, and there were limited times when either of them did because Ty Rogers was on the floor. I know that Brad pivoted away from that early second half, but it was after like a quick 7-0 run out of the gates when it was very clear and obvious in the first half that it wasn't working. And it's frustrating because you had two, this isn't the first time you've seen this. You have two clear examples of going against Purdue and Edie. Now other centers, if you're going against Matty Sissoko, you're going against Owen Freeman, it's different. If they want to put those guys on tie, then it's a different story. When it's 7-2 or in Edie's case, 7-4, and it's that kind of shot blocker, Ty's not going to finish against him very well. And you need that spacing uh, otherwise, you've got that dude just camping out around the rim. He's the he's top ten in the country in shot blocking rate. They're fourth in the country in defense at the rim, and it just clogged everything up. So uh, even you know Coleman said that I wondered if we'd go in it with a different lineup. As, as all the fans and media were like, "Well, Ty Rogers even start the second half." He did. I thought that was a little bit of stubbornness, and I think that there was definitely some of that. I do think hesitancy was an issue for Illinois shooting the three, yes. and then just stubborn driving into him over and over and over again. And I, I'm glad, honestly, um, I'm glad the refs didn't make this a foul fest. I thought clinging for them, I don't think he was getting away with some crazy hacks or anything. It was no. him going straight up and if not, just completely just swatting Illinois. And uh, UConn also has a lot of positional size, um, a good amount of athleticism. You're not having Shannon, you know, on a, on a 6'2 guard where he's able to body him. They, they got Castle at 6'6". They got Newton at 6'5". They're they got a lot of answers. They're top 10 defense in addition, even though their offense gains all that attention. I was about to say they're the number six defense in the, in the country for a reason, plus the number one offense in the country. And they probably go hand in hand a little bit, but they just, they got five NBA players potentially, five of the top 100 NBA prospects, right? Uh, according to ESPN. So uh, phenomenal team. And they made things difficult on Terrence Shannon, obviously at the rim. They ran him off the three point line for the most part. Uh, but I just thought Illinois just made poor decisions and, I thought Brad starting tie in the second half. He always goes with the same starting lineup. This was the game to change that. This this was like Luke Goody was giving you something. It wasn't shooting well, but just gave you more of a threat and it allowed Coleman to have clinging on him and really stretch him out. And it just felt like we never saw that. So those first two minutes, that's when UConn goes what an eleven oh run right there. Ty Rogers subs out. It was just like felt too late. Felt too like you had to make that change. And uh, I didn't like that. Again, I think this is Brad's best coaching job. Um, I thought his players didn't take threes when they needed to take threes. They were hesitant. Looked like this moment was too big. This team was too good uh, for them at points. But that not changing tie. Second, it was clear. It was not a tie game. Yeah, it needed to be moved away from that. You needed to make Klingon. Now there were, there are minutes when Klingon wasn't on the court. Maybe you then throw Ty out there. Let's beyond just the matchup. Ty was tight and lost confidence in a hurry and. Missing layups. Smoked a couple of layups and fumbled the ball. I mean, he was at the Iowa State game. He came out fumbling a little bit, or maybe it was Duquesne. I can't remember uh, which one. Or actually, probably it was Moorhead, I should say, yeah. in, the, in the first round. He he just – he was tight. I thought Illinois in general was a little tight. And as UConn immediately, immediately got that momentum and that crowd going, uh, it was tough to demask credit. Who's, who's the only guy going in the first half? I mean, he had 16 points, I think, Illinois – all the other players outside of him in the first half were four for 25 from the field. It was just, it was mind boggling. Some of the booty ball worked when Klingon was on the bench. They were cooking. They were cooking when uh, he was on the bench, but he was a plus 29 was on the court. That stat from Jeff Brazello and ESPN stats and info is insane. Oh, for 19 on shots where Klingon was contesting. Um, yeah. was, we saw that when it was happening and it just felt like the adjustment was too late um, for Illinois. It was a bad game. plan. Yeah. It's a bad game plan to, you, you got to know how a game might be officiated. Maybe if it's going to be tighter 
and they are calling those. And, of course, yeah, you get two fouls on him in the first half. I know he had one for a long time there, and maybe if you get a second one, that that changes the game in terms of that rim protector there or not. But if you're not getting those calls, then you just – you have to do something differently, I think. And to play to your, your main guy's strengths, if you take Ty out and Klingon has to guard a Gary a or a Hawkins, it's easier for DeMass to play booty ball. Because uh, some of his success even was when Kling was on the court. He just – Kling was having to play kind of in-between game of the guy on the outside and, and, and down low. And then for Shannon to, to open up the, the lane, which it wasn't a good night for him. He didn't – he looked a little – I don't know what it was. He kind of was kind of out of it, uh, lacking – lacking confidence and uh, just wasn't able to get into a rhythm. So uh, UConn does deserve a lot of credit. Um, and maybe even if Illinois had the right game plan, they, they still don't win. But I think the, two things can I be think, true, right? Like two things can yeah. be true that like Illinois game plan was not good enough, but also they still might've lost because UConn's that good. They might've, but then another fair side of it is if the defense plays the way the defense plays in the first half, and you don't dig yourself an immediate hole with that that bad yeah. matchup, that bad approach. Illinois had an opportunity. Illinois had an opportunity where that that offense was scuffling. They don't they don't shoot thirty three percent from the field in the, in very many halves. They don't have clunkers like that from three in very many halves. And really, all that was going for them for the most part in that first half was clinging in one on one matchups against Coleman. So um, it just felt like there was a missed opportunity there. Again, I, I don't know how it plays out, but uh, yeah. it's no, fair absolutely. to be frustrated with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's 23-23 after being down 9 nothing, right? Like, that's right. that's a pretty impressive right. uh, thing for Illinois to have, given how bad uh, they were at that moment. So, uh, also, you can't survive when Terrence Shannon has that bad of a game. Like, he, he's got to be the best player on the court, uh, and he was not. He had eight points. I mean, Amani Hansberry had eight points in the second half. I know the game was out of uh, realm there, but, like, 2-12 from the field – only shot one three-pointer. Like, at one point, I actually just wanted Terrence to shoot a contested on the bounce three just, just uh, to see if he could get going that way. He kept attacking the rim and felt like he made one in the second half, uh, but it felt like he was, like, 0 of 8 at the rim at some point uh, during that game. So, uh, it's just it's, it's a crappy way, crappy way to, to end this season, Derek. But um, anything else on this game? There, I mean, there's not much to break down. The 30-0 run is, is basically it. No, there's really not a, a whole lot to take from it. I like that Amani came in late, made some shots. Uh, that was something that Illinois needed out of their big men. Confident, decisive. Hey, I've got space. I'm going to put it up. And he made a couple of those. That was really good to see. Great sign for next year, Drake. right? Because that's what he needs to do. Yeah. I thought Dre came in and, and gave some energy, fought through some screens on, on Cam Spencer. So uh, good for some of those younger guys to, to have those moments and maybe something to build on. It was some of the – the vets and then obviously the the horses that got you here that that struggled shannon and gary and hawkins having those those nights just that really really hurts you yeah all right derek this is a great season though for illinois 29 and 9 they get to their first elite eight since the 05 team they win a big 10 tournament title it's their first sweet 16 uh it, it was really a great postseason i mean it took the best team in the country to knock you out of this thing so um brad loved this team and he kept talking about it. And they talked about connectivity, uh, how much they enjoyed being around each other. And he saw Brad kind of cut loose. I mean, this NCAA tournament, allowing the chair push in stuff, the uh, uh, super soaker stuff, like, I feel like he really opened up and kind of didn't have to be disciplinarian all the time. And he had a lot of fun with this group, and, and this group had a lot of fun together. So uh, certainly one of the more memorable groups we covered. I mean, the 01 or the 21 group was certainly full of personalities with Georgie and Corbello and Iowa and Kofi and Trent, like plenty of personalities on that crew too. But um, I wrote it in my quick hits. In the modern history, right, since the expansion of the NCAA tournament, um, which was 1975, this is one of the top six teams in Illinois, modern history. Uh, and I don't think they're six. I mean, you go 84, made the Elite Eight, uh, won a Big Ten title. Lou Henson's the only Big Ten title team. Obviously, 89, 05, I think 01 uh, is in there, and 21 is in there. So it's one of the most successful seasons in, in Illinois history. So as much as, as today is, is painful, it's also just kind of a, man, that was that was a hell of a run to cover. It's quite a ride, yeah, for them to, to rally at the right time, to make that – Second weekend for 
first time in forever to get break that streak, to have a legitimizing win against Iowa State, uh, to get the Big Ten tournament title, even though it was a down Big Ten, and and you can say whatever you want to say about that, but won a, a high level game against Wisconsin, and just the the offensive performances that we saw for them to have the other than this team, this team that we just watched in UConn, which they're just incredible. That's the only team that has a better offensive attack, more efficient uh, in the country without a, without a true point guard. So uh, just real credit to the staff for that, for the players, uh, for Marcus Damas to wear such a, a big weight on his shoulders of playmaking and, and diving into a new role in booty ball. And for Terrence, obviously doesn't take away from him having a, a fantastic postseason still outside of this game. So it was a, a great ride, a great team. The chemistry, too. I mean, I think you, you you wrap it all together. I think Brad went into the portal and got the right pieces. And it, both from a, a fit standpoint on the court, but also off the court as far as the chemistry and the way the guys would buy into roles, would buy into winning, would be selfless. And it, it just – it worked. And then to – I asked Brad, too. I know and he he's not going to – fully open up on it until there is price there is some legal resolution but to, to navigate the distraction of of terrence and the what feeling like could have been the end of your year or at least i mean they were still a good team but we all knew that they probably had no chance to get it out of the first weekend without him if he didn't come back and, and then just the woody or won't he he is back but there's so much criticism and so much just attention on that and it's so polarizing that they were able to nav- navigate through it. So handling all that and, and still to win 14 Big Ten games, win a Big Ten tournament, get here, get, uh, again, on the doorstep of a Final Four, says a lot. And it, it, it is a, a super memorable year. I even, you know, we obviously 89, 05, top of the charts. But um, people talk a lot about that 01 team that got to the Elite Eight. I know it's a closer game against Arizona. We're talking difference in free throws on whether that, what team goes to the Final Four. But – Elite eights are remembered pretty fondly, and this one should be no doubt. You said it perfectly. I have nothing to add to that. You hit it uh, out of the park (laughs) there. Uh, 33 MJF, $50 Super Chat. Even at a loss, thank you, 33. Appreciate that, man. Uh, Great season, gents. What did this season mean to you guys personally? It'd be nice having a bunch of postseason games, uh, 2012 grad, so I remember lots of painful years. I know I've mentioned this several times, but – Derek and I have covered a lot of losses, a lot of bad basketball teams. Let's let's be honest. Um, we didn't get to cover an NCAA tournament for my first you know, seven years, or seven of my first couple of years covering this team and really traveling with this team. Uh, I didn't get to cover an NCAA tournament. Derek was there in 21. I wasn't able to be. We could only have one guy there uh, during the bubble stuff. So um, – this run, at times it felt surreal there because we're in the grind. Like This is a big grind being on the road this long, being away from our families, but writing and turning stuff and turning content. But then you get to these moments where it's about to be tip-off tonight or in the Sweet 16 or in the round of 32 or even when Moorhead State is really pushing Illinois and we're thinking, oh, my gosh, we got to deal with this fan base after this. Um, there's just a rush of adrenaline. Uh, and this team was really fun to cover. The personalities were fun to cover. The whole Shannon thing was not fun to cover, right, uh, from start to finish. That has not been fun to cover. We wish we could have been able to talk to him. I understand why he's not. But um, this is why we do this. We want to be around it. We want to cover something special, and these guys were fun. They had fun with this in these last three weeks of postseason play. Derek have been some of the more rewarding things like there's some personal connections, some personal stories, maybe like covering the Browns draft party and covering that weekend was like really meaningful to me um, personally, but to cover this, like this is what we live for. Like the fans get it about like, we love basketball. We love covering big time things and we love telling stories. And these last three weeks have been full of stories. Man. Yeah. I, that's very well said. Uh, I, it makes the grind worth it when you get to come to a place like this and cover these games, see these atmospheres, see just the high level players to take the floor and uh, to tell stories about a team. that's really fun to cover. It's really fun to watch obviously, but then you got personalities um, that, that we appreciate. Uh, we're very fortunate. I think with, with Brad as reporters to, to have him to cover versus Graham McCaffrey or someone else. Uh, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot out there that you could, you could obviously uh, be attached to, but Mr. Howard, um, uh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, um, yeah, to echo, you said we've been through a lot of seasons that lack relevance outside of the, the Illinois circle, really. I mean, even in the Big Ten, it wasn't 
uh, really anything for anyone to care about to, to be here and to know that you know, all the national networks are here, the, the, the coverage, the, the type of reporters that you see uh, that we've gotten to you know meet and we actually get to see them beyond maybe Big Ten Media Day or a day at the Big Ten tournament. Uh, we're like we've talked about before, we had. Hey, let's show up on Wednesday, and uh, when gonna, other guys get here on Friday, we'll be long gone. Awesome. We'll be out. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I also appreciate someone yeah, yeah. real up in Atlanta fan, uh, and just talking to my family, talking to my friends over the last few days and weeks, just the, the ride that they – the emotions and excitement and just some of that yeah. stuff that I, it made me remember when I was a kid at watching 05 or watching the early yeah. 2000s or, or whatnot. So I just know how much it means to people out there. And for this team to be responsible for bringing so much of that that back or just taking it to another level. Because obviously, you know, Io and those guys brought it back. But then to, to take it another step forward was just really, really cool to see. And um, they deserve to be remembered very fondly for that. Sports connects people, right? It brings people together. Yeah. There's so many things in this world that drive people apart. And we can see it on social media all the time, right? Or see it on the news. But – Sports brings people together, and it, it brought this fan base together, right? And, like, my mom and dad are calling me every day asking about what we're doing on the road or what what, what, what they think about the Illini. And my group chats with college friends are, are chatting about the Illini. So it just brings people together. And, man, it's, it's really cool to see. And that, that's why we care so much about this. Uh, it's why people travel to, to cover the team. And it's why, it's why we cover the team because the pet fan base is so passionate. And to bring some of that personality. Of course, we do analysis and break down the basketball. But to, to tell the stories of these teams, uh, we take it seriously. And we have a lot of fun doing it. Court, I really appreciate all you guys do. This was just a fantastically fun year. Have on me, boys, and safe travels back. Tell your wise families, thank you for much transplants. That you uh, help you feel connected to the program. Um, yeah, shout out to our wives and our kids for dealing with this the last couple of weeks, especially. Yes. Uh, but throughout the entire season, it takes it takes a lot of commitment. Big old tough guy as well. You got some loud people behind you, there. I think they're gonna put me in a box or something. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, can you mute that mic here for a little bit while I get through some of these other super chats? Yeah, Tyler, Tyler says, "Cheers, boys! Elite Eight ran into a buzzsaw. Time to reload. DGL isn't effing leaving." I guess we should start talking about that, Derek, is the offseason ahead. Number one is who do you retain? And as you look down this list of, of guys uh, who potentially could return, uh, I'll let Derek move here, but uh, Dane Danger, I caught up with him after the game. It wasn't time, I think, to ask him, hey, are you coming back? But uh, he's got a big decision ahead. And I think Illinois and he got to have a conversation about what his role will be. Is it going to be – uh, the main offensive focal point, or is it going to be, um, you know, do they still want to run five out? Because if it is, that Dane could probably look elsewhere, right? Uh, and then you think of, you know, Coleman said after the game he's gone. Marcus Damas, could he get an NCAA waiver? That will have to pay out. That would obviously be huge for him, and I think he could make as much money uh, in college as he could as, as a professional. So that would be a huge domino for this team. DGL, Amani Hansberry. I got to see if they would come back. Luke Goody and Ty Rogers have been program guys. Um, DG, I talked with Imani Hansberry after the game. He, he sounded like, hey, I can be a leader of this team. I can have a big role on this team. And certainly making three-pointers uh, would help him do that. We know what he can bring defensively and on the glass. So, Derek, what do you think about ret retention for this program and what we should expect? Like, some guys are going to enter the portal. That, that's that's not a doubt. Um, it's just who is it going to be and – and uh, when do we learn about that? And some of these guys might wait until they Illinois adds pieces in the portal uh, to see what their role can be. Yeah, it's going to be hard to know immediately. I think that, of course, you always expect some guys to go in. I do think and agree with the idea that there might be a player or two that may early on the front end say that they're going to stay or just be noncommittal on it, maybe see some of the additions and then, feel like it's in their best interest to move on. So uh, I know people are wondering about Sincere Harris. I asked him in the locker room, I said, you know, kind of how are you approaching this? Are you happy being at, at Illinois right now? Do you foresee a, a path where you like what it looks like? He said, I'm in a great situation and, and I do. So, um, but things can change. Things can change as far as that goes. Uh, I think the Dane Dane is one that they're going to have to have some real conversations with. And I, I think that Dane will – obviously voice that he wants a bigger role than he had this year. And because he can get it somewhere. Of, he can get it. Yeah, somewhere right. No. And 
I, I truly, I was talking to some people, you know, in the last few days, just uh, trying to get a feel. And I know that sometimes you, you, you want to make sure what's said publicly aligns with what's kind of going on behind the scenes. They're like, it's not coach speak when we say Dane's been great. Like his mentality has been awesome. He's been very unselfish. And, and now it, it really is time for, as his eligibility clock winds down, it's time for him to go be selfish. And whether that means it works for us here or it's him going somewhere else, and it, it seemed like that's something they're gonna just going to have to talk about. So um, DGL tweeted out that he's staying. I, uh, he, he did the – I'm not effing leaving, and uh, we'll, we'll take him at his word for now. I, I feel like Amani has, has always throughout this season had a good mindset, known that it wasn't going to be an immediate big role for him. Uh, I do think that Dane and his situation probably goes – probably affects each other. If Dane stays, there's a harder path for Imani to get on the court. If not, it's easier for Merez and Imani probably to, to immediately find it. But uh, it is something that's going to have to just play out over the weeks as we find out more and more about who Illinois is, is trying to get. And, and then the exit meetings will will kind of see if there's things that need to be ironed out in certain situations and whatnot. But there are, there's going to be a lot of turnover. I'd imagine there's going to be at least somebody that hits the portal and um, that's just the way every offseason goes in the, the current environment of college basketball. Yeah, and Brad had a lot of uh, strong words about the portal and how dumb it is that uh, they're doing this while the Elite Eight is happening. Now, there's another side of that, Derek, uh, that you brought up before we, we got on here, and that's Illinois could FaceTime a portal guy from TD Garden <laughs> at the Sweet 16, at the Elite Eight, at the Big Ten. Well, no, I guess not at the Big Ten tournament because the portal wouldn't open then, but uh, at the first round, second round of the NCAA tournament, they had something to sell while this is happening. So it stinks that the assistants have to spend hours a day as they're preparing for an Elite Eight, and I don't think that had any impact here. I doubt these guys got much sleep over the last several weeks, but uh, Illinois has got a heck of a sell to a lot of transfers here. And, you know, I, I think people had fun this season, like in, in the program. So uh, I think those guys say, hey, we, we can do big things here NBA, get to the NBA from here. We'll see what happens with Terrence Shannon and Coleman Hawkins. But uh, we can be a national championship team. And the stuff Dre has been saying the last couple of weeks, like this guy is bought in. Um, I talked to him yesterday. And uh, I know you guys, I think I got a chance to catch up with him a couple of weeks ago. Like this kid sounds like he's he's all about um, Illinois right now, which is hard. I mean, Amani and Dre, really good players that could have played at – worst programs this year. Um, so to keep those guys and Ty Rogers and Luke Goody and, and guys like that in the program, um, those guys matter. You see the, the impact Coleman Hawkins has. Um, just having somebody who's been a part of this knows the standard. It's great to have. It's great to have that content, uh, retention. It's great to have people that carry over what worked from this team. Uh, people that know what went into the whether it's work ethic, chemistry, uh, just – knowing Brad and having that, that connection player coach, like to be able to carry over standards, to be able to carry over just the vibes of the program and, and keepers of the culture, as Brad likes to say. So uh, that's always important and, and situations matter. Like you want, you understand that players um, sometimes need to move on or should move on. Uh, it could be for the better of them, but uh, I think it's, it's really good that the Dre is, of that mindset to come back. And he's, of course, has high potential. I, I think, obviously, we, we know he's had a rep as a scorer. I think he's shown some things that he could be an impact defender, I feel like, athletically and how hard he plays. And um, I, I'm sure he got better competing every day on the court with guys like Terrence and um, just in general, you know, Marcus and whatnot. So that's that's good to know and, and to have. So, uh, But, yeah, to, to return to what you were saying first, I know Brad today, and it makes total sense, like, why there's anything pulling your attention away from this. Like the fact that the NCAA is allowing, I mean, there are transfers who can go on campuses or coaches who didn't make the postseason can go maybe even have a head start, go have in-home visits with, with guys while other teams are, are playing and playing for their seasons and legacies and banners and cutting down nets. Like that's all crazy that that, that situation exists. But I will say another side of that is in talking to some people, I think the staff liked being able to jump on the horn after the Iowa State win and say, hey, did you watch the game? What would you think? Here's, yeah, TD Garden and uh, our stuff's on Sports Center and, and all this yes. kind of stuff. Like that, that gives you some real pop and appeal. And um, 
So it, it, it works both ways uh, as far as that goes. But I understand why Brad's frustrated about it. Uh, but even if you weren't able, I guess his counter might be, even if we couldn't talk to people right now, we could still use you know people watching us as an advantage. We don't maybe necessarily have to be talking to them while we're in between watching film or having practice or walkthrough or what have you. Yeah. All right, Rick C, $20 Super Chat. Thank you, Rick. What is Coleman's draft stock this year? Also, I didn't agree with the game plan of going right at Goliath under the rim either. I would have rather saw Danger. Danger doesn't stretch him out, though, so I – I didn't know if it was a danger game either. Like defensively, he would have done a better job, but offensively, that was the issue. Like the issue was offense. Yeah, as crazy yeah. as it is, as crazy <laughs> yeah. it is for Illinois' defensive issues and for UConn to have all these sets and all these weapons. It was Illinois' offense that was just not able to create advantages and not able to. You know, they're they're this mismatch seeking offense, and they presented the mismatch themselves. They didn't counter away from it. Coleman's draft stock, second round pick is probably his best case. Uh, it seems like a, he's not a first rounder. Uh, will he get drafted? I, I think he's the kind of guy that can get a two way deal. Uh, I, I think he showed the skill. He showed the shooting, Derek. We know he's a better defender at the four than at the five. And I think he was frustrated throughout the year individually that he had to guard fives. Uh, he's talked about that. Um, but the team did win the way they, they played. Now, defensively, they weren't very good, but. Um, that's how they played great offense, which was Coleman at the five. So I thought offensively he showed his skill set. I think defensively during his career he's shown his skill set. The emotion part, I think he's going to have to answer for. Um, you know, his up and down emotions, but I think Brad is going to rave about him. Um, but he's a flawed prospect, but he's a good prospect, and, and, and I think a, a bad draft. So I hope he's a second-round pick. I hope he can get a two-way deal or something. Hopefully he can get a guaranteed deal. But uh, I, I think he'll be on an NBA team uh, in the summer for sure. And what he makes of that, whether he's on a roster full time, we'll have to wait and see. I agree with that. I think as of now, I would guess probably late second round pick, maybe in the yeah. middle. Depends on how it goes. Uh, he wasn't going to get drafted. Like that was the feedback last year that pretty much led him to coming back. So he's improved his stock. There's no doubt. I mean, the way he shot the three, uh, he was more consistent. You look at his game logs and to be consistently in double figures the way that he was. Uh, I think defensively. Look, I don't think NBA front office people or evaluators are going to be confused and say, well, you know, why did he not guard fives very well? He, he's not a five. Like he, that, it is kind of – I think Cole with some of his frustrations, and he kind of hinted at it or flat out said it. Like he wanted to play with Dane because he wanted to play the four. He wanted to be able to guard on the perimeter, switch, roam around, use his strengths there. I, I think he was a little frustrated that he had to stay in the paint and play that position – because out of necessity, but also because it was how Illinois had their advantages offensively. Yep. Let's space it out. It was kind of the give and take there. So uh, Coleman kind of had to be a, a, a good soldier as far as that goes. But yeah, I'd say I'd say late second round. I just think he's ready. I just think he's ready to yeah. go. I think um, you know you can't improve older guys anymore. coming back to college. Yeah, yeah it's so hard. So uh, he's ready, and um, he he had a really good career at Illinois, especially on the latter end. The bigger question will be where's Terrence go, and a lot of that has to do with his his legal resolution here. Uh, but from what we hear, late first, early second, because uh, some teams really like him. Uh, I think it's gonna, but his age is going to work against him too. But he's a guy that can help a contender, like and be a, a depth guy, uh, potentially get into a, a rotational role. I think uh, in the NBA. So uh, hopefully, Ono has a couple guys get drafted. That's always good for your program as well. Fedigator, he should chance? be picked in the first round. Can I say that real yes. quick? Like, yes. I think Jaime Jaquez has showed this year that just because the dude's played a handful of years in college doesn't necessarily mean that he shouldn't be drafted in that range. I know some are just hunting the upside, but um, he's a he's a real talent that should, from a yeah ability standpoint and I think impact standpoint, ready to come in and, and do something for somebody standpoint. Yeah, uh, he should be a first round. Pick. Uh, Fedigator, any chance the DIA would allow you to interview Terrence uh, just about the season? Great season. Thanks again for all these podcasts. Uh, $5 Super Chat. Thank you, Fedigator. No, that's not happening because his lawyers are not doing it. Uh, and another guy I'd like to talk to about this season was, was Josh Whitman. And uh, we've asked for that. We'll, we'll see if, if that comes to fruition either. There's pending litigation against the University of Illinois with all of this. So uh, I think that's why they're that's what they told us is, is why uh, Josh Whitman has not been made available yet. So, uh, but this is a great season for, for him and Brad Underwood to get it back here, Derek. And, and now you have to reload. 
and now you have to to go into that portal and, and get some big time talent because you're losing some big time talent. Uh, Terrence Shannon Jr., one of the greatest players in Illinois history. Coleman Hawkins, uh, one of the winningest players in, in Illinois history, and just uh, a key cog of this. Marcus Damask at, at NCAA waiver. I'm going to leave open the door for there to see if that can happen. I I don't love the odds of it. Uh, and from what we hear, the only probably doesn't love the odds of it, but you shoot your shot uh, with that. Quincy Garrier was a good piece. Not the best finish for him uh, to end the season, but, boy, he was good in, in December and January for you. Justin Harmon, again, didn't end the season all that well, but he was an impact piece for you. Um, so, so much to, to replace on this team. And uh, Illinois does have a sell in the portal, but they're star hunting, Derek. And we know they're attached to A.J. Store. We did not make that crystal ball pick for Illinois but we know Illinois is going to be a major player uh, for AJ store. And that's what they got to land. You got to add that kind of talent there. They're going to be in the mix for a, a lot of good pieces this year. And with the NIL that Illinois has, I say there's cap space opening up, right? So Illinois is going to have some to, to spend with that, that NIL. So um, it's going to be a busy off season. It's going to start right now. It's already started. Yeah. It's already started. Um, Check our board, little plug there uh, yeah. on that. But um, yeah, I, I think as far as a sell goes, I mean, the winning, the the way the transfers came in and performed and developed, like Terrence in the, over a two year span, obviously, I think that's there, there's no more obvious of a sell to AJ Store than Terrence Shannon, but also I think a big guard like Ayo Desumu, what he did at Illinois, and, and then NIL appeal, home state type of guy, uh, and a former Illini commit. So uh, he makes a ton of sense. And of course he would be considered a star level ad. And then I think also that you have to get, it's funny. We had conversations. Maybe we should do a podcast on this. If you're playing GM and you're trying to make the numbers work. And of course we're just projecting. Sometimes we know uh, or hear of what certain dollar figures are, but um, you can't just go get, you know, $4 million dudes. Like that's not going to be, uh, a reality for Illinois or anything like that. So, you, and I think just in general, you got to understand that you got to have some guys who are in a starring role, and then you got to go out and get some. You know, Quincy Garrier was a really nice supporting piece, and he, yep. they weren't going to ask him to do more than that. And part of I think Illinois' success was that Quincy knew that, that Illinois knew that, and that there was just a, an understanding and a and a, a, a seamless fit into that kind of a role where, um, you know. The previous year, you had some guys who Terrence was part of that. Uh, Meyer was part of that. From a, there were a number of issues, but asking them to do more than they had done before. So yeah. I think that they will try to go get some role guys. I know they want a shooter. I know they want um, yeah, at least one ball handler. Can, yeah. Let's let's do this. Let's rank. Let's rank this, and we'll we'll wrap up here because we'll do a whole off season yeah. pod. But just to get people want to talk about this, I understand. So just to to wrap up the pod here, like number one need is just that star wing. Like an AJ store level guy, like Illinois can go get that guy. Now, Kansas, Kentucky, big time schools are going to want that guy too. So, you got top competition, yep. but Illinois needs to go get that kind of player. Need number two is it a truly guard, Derek? <clears throat> now, Damask might depend on that, but you need another league guard, whether it's a one, a combo, um, somebody like that that can, I think, create uh, off the bounce. Now, maybe Dre can be that, and you get somebody who can. You know, be a, a level above Justin Harmon type of player who can be a double digit scorer, create a little bit uh, for himself and teammates. I think that would be my number two. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I do think it maybe, depending, it, it could be a close competition between that and stretch four. Because yeah, that, that was my that was going to be the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, you need kind of a Coleman replacement as you think about. Amani and Merez. Now, Amani made two threes today, has the ability to stretch it a little bit, but Amani, Merez, Ty Rogers, Sincere Harris, if he's back, guys that don't shoot maybe at all or very well, you need somebody in that four role to, to shoot the ball and, and stretch the floor, maybe be a little bit of a, a secondary playmaker type. So, uh, But I do. I, I think that Marcus covered up so much in terms of not having a point guard and, and being able to create – uh, and, and have an, a way to to be a initiator and, and an offensive hub, as you'd say. So whether it's going to be a, like a true ball screen point guard or whether it's going to be the guy that can play booty ball, 
we'll see. But I, I do agree with the just the on ball creator being in that in that role. Although the stretch four is really important too. Yeah, so that would be two and three. Some combination of those two for me, and then just another shooter. You just you got to add more shooters um, because next year's team, you think Ty Rogers, if it's Dane Danger or Marez Johnson or Amani Hansberry, maybe Amani can can shoot it a little bit, and maybe he really shows that next year. But there's just a, a lack of of known shooters. Sincere Harris, if he's back, right? Like, so I think you need another, hopefully bigger shooter. Um, and is it Jake Davis from Mercer that that Illinois yep. has been connected to? He'd be a good one. Nine points a game at Mercer, shot 39% from three. Is there some booty ball potential? I don't know. He's a big body, uh, but, man, he, he shoots it at a high level on catch and shoots. Yeah, and only a freshman uh, guy that has multiple years. I know with the multi-transfer rules right now, you, you can't assume that you land him and he's going to be there long term, but uh, he's somebody that they – really like as a, a pure shooter with some size at six, seven. And I think maybe even you, you try to get multiple dudes that are just, I don't know if it, you want their only skill to be shooting, but as you saw today with UConn, it's great to have Spencer and Caravan and Newton can shoot it. And, uh, so it, it's great to, to be able to do that. So I even think they're the lead guard or, or on ball type of guy to have him be a shot maker too from the perimeter is something that will be important because yes, you're, you're losing, you're losing that, and some of the guys that can return outside of Luke Goody, and I, I do think Dre can develop into, even though he struggled with his jump shot this year, develop into a pretty good shooter. He's kind of been up and down through his his high school career at that, but uh, that's something that they definitely need. They have athleticism, they have toughness, they have rebounding. They're going to need some some shot making. Uh, Rick C, last one we we'll do here. Find it interesting that big men can still dominate college ball, but not so much in the Steph Curry era NBA. And we are talking about Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic. They're kind of the MVP guys of the league right now in a seven-footer out of Greece uh, and Giannis that kind of taking over the league. But you got to have skill. you got to have skill at that position most likely. That's why it's going to be interesting to see where Klingon gets drafted. I, I don't think he's a top-five guy because he's not an offensive guy. And you want to get upside there. So, all right, we'll, we'll wrap this up as they're drilling around Derek. Oh, my goodness. Can't find a place to, to be quiet around here. But um, thank you to you all for following us throughout this postseason. I mean, these Super Chats the last couple of nights have been unbelievable with your support. It allows us to do what we do and travel the country following this team. So, Derek, any final thoughts before uh, – they take you down with all the equipment over there. I don't want to say anything more. <laughs> That's it. Everybody, I think done with me. <laughs> have a great night. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time on the Atlanta Enquirer podcast. <laughs>